Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Leslie Parkins and I'm the Assistant Vice President for Civic Engagement with, Duke, with the Duke Office of Durham and Community Affairs. I'm thrilled to have you all here for today's resource panel for the Community Engaged Scholarship Collaborative. Today we will hear from partners across Duke who will highlight offerings that support and strengthen our knowledge and practice of academic and community collaborations. We will hear from campus partners representing the Community Engaged Scholarship Collaborative, Duke Clinical and Translational Science Institute, Duke Engage, Bass Connections, the Duke Global Health Institute, Duke Faculty Right, Forum for Scholars and Publics, the Social Science Research Institute, and Duke Service Learning. Thank you to all of our campus partner representatives for being here today. We are happy to highlight the expertise and resources you offer. I would like to now introduce Liz Shapiro Garza, who is an associate professor of the practice of environmental policy and management, and also serves as the faculty director for engaged scholarship with Duke Civic Engagement. Liz will kick us off by sharing about the resources available through the Community Engaged Scholarship Collaborative, and will also facilitate today's panel. We do encourage folks to share questions you may have throughout today's session in the chat function. Liz, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thanks so much, Leslie. Um, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here. I know uh, a Friday afternoon is not necessarily when you wanna be spending an, another Zoom session. So <laughs> for our panelists and also our participants, thank you for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Uh, just to know also, um, you can ask questions in the chat throughout if you'd like, and our panelists may um, respond there. Uh, but also we will be sending out a list afterwards um, of all the resources that have been mentioned so that you don't need to feel like you need to madly scramble uh, to get them all down. Um, and with that, I'll begin. Uh, I'm going to actually start talking first about uh, some resources that um, uh, Duke Civic Engagement and uh, through Durham and Community Affairs, where Duke Civic Engagement is located, um, uh, some resources that we are offering through what we're calling the Community Engaged Scholarship Collaborative. And the Community Engaged Scholarship Collaborative um, is really focused on bringing together and serving as a hub for um, the many centers as represented today at Duke that provide support, whether that's learning opportunities, funding, um, and other resources uh, for engaged scholars at Duke um, to serve as a hub so that we have a centralized place to not only coordinate those efforts, uh, but really to try and make them visible. Uh, to people who are doing engaged scholarship and so that we can actually promote this approach at Duke um, and increase the value that it's given um, within our system and our institution. So that's our mission. Um, we also offer some resources directly for community engaged scholars. And uh, I'll just focus on those and I'll give a very brief overview. Um, and there's a lot more information on our website as there are, again, for most of these opportunities. Um, but there is, we do offer an annual fellowship. So for community engaged scholars and their community partners, um, you can apply uh, at, towards the end of the spring uh, for these fellowships. The model is for a cohort of fellows to go through uh, the program together, to be able to learn from each other and learn from mentors, uh, community partner and Duke uh, faculty mentors uh, who are have a lot of experience in engaged fellowship. And also to have kind of a more structured approach to taking advantage of all of these resources and learning opportunities that we have at Duke for engaged scholarship. We also offer a small grants program um, uh, every year. And again, the application is uh, towards the end of the spring semester. Um, and these are grants are available for Duke faculty and staff um, and in conjunction with their community partners. It the the uh, application has to originate from the Duke partner, but you can involve community partners as well. And the idea, again, is to uh, develop further develop an already existing um, community engaged scholarship effort or initiative. We have so many different um, lunch and uh, op learning opportunities, including a lunch and learn session, a workshop series. And this spring, we will be offering in conjunction um, with uh, Siri uh, that uh, Leonor Casino will be talking about next uh, and CTSI, um, an engaged scholarship uh, symposium or conference uh, in which we'll be highlighting uh, all of the different, many of the different efforts at Duke and the amazing partnerships uh, and ongoing work that is being done. 
And again, with the idea of both highlighting the work, uh, giving people a chance to learn from each other, um, and also to increase the visibility and the value that's placed on this approach and the people who are taking it. Um, so I would encourage you to check out our website. And also, if you have not yet signed up for our, our list, our listserv, we have a wonderful newsletter that goes out monthly um, that highlights not only the opportunities we're providing, but all of the opportunities that all of our partners uh, who are here today are offering um, so that you get a, a hopefully a pretty complete picture of learning opportunities and resources at Duke for this work. I'm going to turn this over to Leonor Casino, who's going to be talking about the Duke Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Uh, Leonor, please uh, feel free to take it away. Hi, um, I'm Leonor Corsino. I'm an associate professor of medicine um, and also an associate professor of population health science department at the School of Medicine. And I'm one of the co-directors for the uh, CTSI Siri, which is Community Engagement Research Initiative. I want to acknowledge that my partner in crime here is also joining us in the call, Eve Marion. So I'm going to try to summarize some of the wonderful um, opportunities we have to offer for all of you interested in engaging in community engagement research. Um, so our court within the CTSI promotes community engagement research by cultivating research community stakeholder partnership, enhancing the capacity to conduct stakeholder engaged research and fostering trust and transparency in research by improving knowledge, information sharing, and power sharing. Uh, we have three main aims. I'm not gonna read all of them as you can see them in the PowerPoint. And we have several major programs. Uh, one is the AME Scion Health Equity Advocacy and Liaison Program, where we collaborate very closely with the AME Scion Church uh, and provide some support in order to enroll in African-American participants into research. Uh, we have the community consultation studio that has been a very popular program that we've been offering where we can actually engage with the community in order to provide feedback for uh, potential or ongoing projects. We also have the spark innovation studios and we have the population health improvement awards. So the RFA for the PHR will be announced soon. So look up for it. Uh, we have two awards of 50,000. Uh, so please apply for the <laughs> award. Um, also, we have the Siri library, which includes a lot of resources, not only for the investigators, but also for our community partners that might want to learn a little bit more about what is community engaged research. Uh, during the last year and a half, because of the COVID pandemic, we were able to integrate uh, members of our team into some coalitions that emerged in order to respond to the pandemic. Uh, we have team members in the ACT Plus, which is the African-American COVID Response Team Plus, and also the Latin 19, which is a coalition that includes interdisciplinary stakeholders focusing on the Latinx population. And we also have members of Siri uh, working very closely with Aging Well Dorm. Uh, we offer uh, consultations. Um, you can actually request a consultation using the links and uh, listed in the PowerPoint slide here, uh, consultations regarding who can partner with you in a project, how do I do something related to community engagement, how can I actually take advantage of some of the resources the CTSI has to offer, and so on. Uh, we also have a strong partnership with our colleagues at NCCU, and we offer three main projects in there. The Top two uh, listed in here are the ones that have been mostly active during the last couple of years, and that include the ethnodramas and the mind, body, spirit. Uh, the community tours have been on hold, um, but it's something we have offered in the past. Uh, the last thing that we're really working uh, with other courts in the CTSI and other um, organizations at Duke is the community engagement training and education program. And the goal is to actually create a catalog of training that actually will inform how are the best practice to engage into community engagement. Uh, and we are trying to make it more accessible to the rest of the Duke University community. So with that, I will stop here and I pass it back to Liz. Thank you. Leonor, thank you so much. And Eve, thanks for all the work that you're doing as well. Um, really appreciate it. And as you can see, there's so much, <laughs> so much there. <laughs> I hope you all can take advantage of it. Um, do, next, we have Carly Pio um, from uh, Duke Engage. Uh, Carly, are you ready to, 
take it away. Carly, I think you might be muted. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, it's Charlie. Um, yes. Yeah, so I think many of you already know um, uh, probably a lot about Duke Engage. It's an undergraduate program um, uh, which sends students um, all over the world um, as well as domestically um, to um, engage in, in, in community partnerships. Um, it's been dramatically cut in the last couple of years. We lost um, half of our funding. Um, and we're entirely supported by endowment um, uh, funds now. So we're, we're down from 400 students a year to 200, um, from over 40 projects to, I think this next summer, we're, we're planning on 23, 13 international, 10 domestic. Um, the student numbers uh, vary by program, but it's anywhere from six to 15 or so per program. Um, uh, all of the um, programs are, are now led by faculty members. Um, a few years ago, a third of the programs were led by third party um, VSOs, they called them, um, and they've all been cut out. So they're all led by faculty members. Um, there's a push um, uh, by those of us who um, are involved in running Duke Engage and encouraged by the, the deans and the provost. Um, to make the programs um, uh, tie into the academic mission of the un university more. So to build more research into the uh, various projects. And that's something that the students themselves, um, at least in my own experience, I've been taking students for um, 15 years now to um, Togo in uh, Northern Togo in West Africa. The students themselves um, every year ask if they can't do more sort of hands-on research, um, but it's uh, in com it will always, uh, I think, be in, in, in combination with um, uh, community partner programs that are run in, in the various communities. Um, it's fully funded by um, now by the by, by an endowment fund, so the students don't pay anything, um, and um, their transportation, their room and board uh, for two months each summer. Um, is fully funded. This year, of course, there are going to be a lot of moving parts. We're, um, we're planning to um, have all of our programs be face-to-face, -face, um, but we've pushed the application date back to um, early January. Usually it's in November, um, and we have all the, 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 the programs locked down by December, um, which um, for those of us who've always asked students to take courses to prepare themselves, I've always done an independent study with students before they go to, to West Africa. It was a great thing because they could, um, they could um, have, find space in, the, in, their, in their spring schedules to take the class. Uh, this year, that won't be possible. Um, we won't know until mid-February who's going where. Um, but uh, as I'm sure most of you know, the uh, the Global Travel Committee has a list of countries and areas of the world that are possible to travel to and others that aren't, and that list changes every week. So we're holding our breath to, to, uh, to, to see whether the programs that we currently have in place will hold. Six of them are in Africa, and um, as you know, there's been less COVID um, uh, on the continent than, than elsewhere. China is off the list. We've had uh, a couple of programs every year in China, but there's a Right now, there's a three-week quarantine, uh, so um, you know that would it'd be hard to run a program um, if the first three weeks were um, in quarantine. And um, so, all of that is unknown at present, and we're imagining that we're going to be scrambling quite a bit, um, you know, in January and February to uh, to nail things down. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop there. I, I, I I'm willing to field questions from folks, but. Um, uh, yeah, that's the nature of the that's the nature of our programs. Thank you so much, Charlie. And I'm sorry I changed your name <laughs> to Carly, um, but thank you so much. And actually, I think uh, just to emphasize, so much of the I know some a lot of the programs are here domestically as well. So if people are interested in applying for programs uh, for communities in North Carolina, um, that's an option as well. Um, all right, so thanks. I'm going to uh, go ahead and switch now to uh, Bass Connection. Laura Howes, are you ready to? Yeah, sure. Okay. 
Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Howes. I'm the director of Best Connections. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, Best Connections is an opportunity for um, faculty, staff, and students to work together on collaborative research projects that are grounded in a societally relevant issue. So um, if you can see on the small little map here, we have many teams that have community partners, um, especially here locally in Durham and the broader North Carolina area. And then we also have a set of teams that are doing um, global research that has obviously looked a little bit different over the last year or so. But um, I think interestingly, the pandemic has created opportunities for um, people to work a little bit differently in global environments and connect, um, stay connected globally. In terms of opportunities for people to engage in the program, um, we have a couple uh, resources here. The first is our year-long research team. So every year we have about 60 different research teams. These are proposed by faculty along with staff and graduate students. Um, and then we work to recruit a team of students to work on the project teams. So they're interdisciplinary research teams that take place over the course of a year. Uh, we provide funding of up to $25,000 to support those projects and um, students participate for academic credit. In addition, we have some affiliated summer programs, Story Plus and Data Plus, um, both of which are um, collaborative team-based research opportunities for students in the summer. Faculty and staff can propose projects as well on an annual basis. Um, and many of these are also connected to issues of societal importance. So um, there's been a growing number of Data Plus projects, for example, that have been looking at and partnering with local communities in Durham, um, looking at data on eviction rates, for example, and helping to visualize and kind of shine a light on inequities in Durham. Uh, we also have student research awards, just to note that if you have students who are looking for funding to do something that's um, engaged, they can apply annually for our student research awards, which are for collaborative student-driven research, or we also have some individual student research awards. That's for both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, and then we have a growing number of um, efforts we are doing around integrating more collaborative team-based work into the curriculum through what we call collaborative project courses. So we have a resource center on our website for faculty designing courses that might be um, you know, collaborative and project-based. I mentioned this in the context of this session because often those courses are also um, have strong alignment with service learning and community engagement, often um, you know, doing client-based projects with local community partners. Um, and so that's something we're increasingly looking at is what is the growing body of research, um, the courses at Duke that are focused on kind of community and applied engagement and how do we support those activities? Um, so our contact information is at the bottom, happy to answer other questions. Uh, the last thing I'll just say is that, you know, the majority, I'd say two thirds of our teams have strong community engagement. And this little quote at the bottom, I think shows that um, we really find when there is a strong community partnership that the research has a bigger impact um, and that both students and faculty, as well as our community partners have, um, you know, better experiences because it's really connected to an applied setting. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much. Um, and again, I, I know uh, some probably a lot of the people on this call have been supported through your efforts. So thank you. Um, all right, uh, next up we have uh, Global Health Institute, Sammy Ariely. Uh, Sammy, would you like to go ahead and take it away? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here and to hear about all of the different programs. I know I know a lot of you, um, and I'm just looking forward to hearing and learning more. Um, so the Global Health Institute is an institute. We're interdisciplinary, um, and we have so that basically means we have faculty who have appointments within the institute, but also primary appointments in probably every other department um, uh, and school at Duke. So we work across the School of Medicine, School of Nursing, um, and the, on the campus side. Um, and essentially what I did on the, on the um, right-hand column is we've got three basic organized around our educational programs, our collaborative research programs, um, and then the, the funding and um, consultation work we do. So we have a lot of student facing, so that means Duke affiliated um, curricular programs, 
we have an undergraduate major and minor. Uh, we have a master's um, degree program. We have a graduate uh, certificate. That means graduate students in a variety of other um, departments can get a certificate in global health. A doctoral scholars program, the same thing, doctoral students in other departments who, would, who want to get a focus in global health. And then um, a school of medicine third year study program and a global health pathway. So those are all Duke student um, and Duke affiliated training programs for Duke affiliated trainees. Um, but all the work we do, basically educational and research is applied in that the, the really the mission of the Institute and the reason we were developed was to think about how to do knowledge in the service of society, very much like Duke Engage as well, uh, with the same spirit. And so um, for the collaborative projects, I guess the way I would organize it, because there's so much there, we have a lot more on our website, but on the student facing piece and on our community partner facing piece, primarily this has been done internationally. We have always have had faculty for the last few decades who are Duke faculty who've done local work in North Carolina and the Southeast and across, uh, across the US. So part of what we're trying to do is to think about how to, develop, to continue developing those applied and service oriented um, uh, scholarship and research to integrate it with both student learning needs as well as then community partner development needs. So part of what we do in this other column is to think about co-developing projects. We've always done this internationally, but also now locally in North Carolina um, with a variety of different CBOs, community-based organizations, NGOs, individual community members who have an interest in thinking about the associated determinants of health, root causes of health um, issues. And so we provide consultation and support for um, program development. That means across other Duke units or across other institutions like NCCU, we have partnerships with them and NC State. Um, and of course, a variety of partnerships internationally. Um, but then also joint curricular development and training programs. So for example, a One Health program that we have with NC State and NCCU, um, where it's, it's curricular training, not just for Duke affiliated folks, but for folks in the community and with our sister institutions that also very often are closer to and serve underserved and vulnerable populations. Um, so we have internship and practice-based projects, again, that could be community members and partners who are interested in having students involved in their work, but it could also just be community partners and members who would like to connect with faculty doing global health work and to co-develop ideas um, and program direction. So we do consultation and support for that. Um, the local is global is um, essentially a more formalized acknowledgement of the fact that while we've always worked locally, our, our site and our, um, and our general practices have been internationally oriented. And so what we're doing with the local and global is really highlighting this multi-directional learning that needs to happen, which means our value added, we think, as an institute coming into and saying we're working in Durham with all of you have always worked in Durham and many people in the School of Medicine and School of Nursing have for decades done deep um, community engaged work in Durham. So part of what we're hoping to add as value in the space is this idea of taking the international lessons and knowledge we have from work in international communities and sharing that in a variety of ways locally, as well as sharing local work globally um, and South to South. So a lot of the work we've done internationally is to try and build partnerships between communities within the global South for each other we're there to facilitate and then to get out of the way and to let them continue developing those collaborations. So really informally, our, our effort is to work ourselves out of a job. That means building partnerships with communities um, and, and empowering communities to apply the work and the research and the knowledge in a way that um, we can support and then it can be carried on sustainably. Um, so part of what we are are working on and provide both funding as well as consultation to do is to say if there are community members here who are interested in understanding the work that's done in global health internationally, 
um, and vice versa? Are there ways that we can help connect community partners here, working with immigrant communities, let's say in our Latino community to the work we do in Honduras and Venezuela and Brazil? And are there community partners that we have in those countries who are interested in learning about the disparities we have um, in the US? And how do we facilitate those conversations? So that's a big part of what um, we are hoping to do and would like to continue supporting doing. Um, and then the funding, um, just very quickly, we have funding for, again, Duke affiliated students and faculty to do a variety of this work. We also have funding for visiting scholars. That means non Duke affiliated folks. Right now, it's primarily international visiting scholars, but of course, locally, if there are um, individuals who would like to um, delve more deeply into the research and scholarship components of global health, there are ways that we can support um, some of that, that learning. Um, travel partnership development. So we, we've always had grants for our faculty to go to new locations to develop partnerships and to explore um, collaborations. And uh, I, I think we are hoping to also allow that to, to have committee partners apply for that type of funding to say, we'd like to partner with you to go somewhere else and to explore some of that local to global um, work. I mean, I think we're going to uh, just to be cognizant. Yeah, I'm done. Okay, <laughs> thanks. No, it's, it is. So you, you do so much, so it's hard to hard to explain it uh, quickly. But I think again, all of this um, I think can be found on your website. No, is it is it possible to find this pretty easily? Uh, so I would encourage people to look at that. And also, I will just note too that so much of this is about uh, knowing who to talk to. So you now have a name uh, when you want to go ask uh, about Sumi Ariely and figure out about the resources that Global Health Institute has to offer. Um, but next next up is uh, Faculty Right with Jennifer Ahern Dodson. Jennifer, are you ready to talk about Faculty Right? Hi, yes, thanks. Thanks, Liz. Um, I'm Jennifer Ahern Dodson. I'm director of the uh, Duke Faculty Right Program. And one way to think about this program in the context of our work is how can we share the, what we're learning in our community engaged work more broadly? Um, what does that look like? Particularly a challenge for those of us who might be assessed traditionally in buckets of teaching, research, and service. You know, where does the community piece fit? or for our community engaged research, it cuts across all three of those, right? And for faculty, uh, it's often, how do I make visible the impacts of this work in ways that the institution will understand, for example, for promotion and tenure, or they might be working on a journal article. Uh, but it's also in addition to, you know, helping traditional routes of scholarship, I believe very strongly in the, uh, many of you know the University UNC Greens UNC um, G. Well, I don't know why I can't say that today. Modeled the mosaic of scholarship, right? That when we're doing community engaged work, it's also needs assessment that our community partners needs. It, it, it is also training manuals. It's policy memos. It's collaboratively written grants. And so when we think about advancing the work of scholarship, it cuts across students, faculty, community partners. So a lot of the resources that um, we have in the, in the program that I direct include making space like through retreats, like how do you get um, a student, community partner and faculty member just together in one space to write up an article? Um, how do you think about working across the state with engaged scholars so that they have a space that's apart from their institutional work to connect with other faculty and community partners and engaged scholars who are directing programs and also writing up the work. So some of the resources directly connected to community engaged work. Um, um, I uh, lead a North Carolina Engaged Scholar Writing Retreat every year. This has been the fourth year. We have one a couple of weeks ago. It's in October and March. Magically, people are still coming together, even though it's on Zoom, which is actually incredible for universities at different um, parts of the state that maybe it's harder to get to, to travel to in terms of funding. And it is a sense of community across the state, but also just being able to focus on writing up scholarship and then the connection that Liz talked about at the beginning, right? Who else is doing this work? How might we work together? 
Um, another avenue of support that's offered through the Faculty Right Program is workshops, um, both publishing engaged scholarship, like I have this project that I've done, what do I do with it now? What are possible venues? The kinds of questions to ask that connect with alignment with evaluation standards, or, you know, how, how can a community partner voices be represented differently uh, in some journals versus it may not be a traditional journal that we really need those community partner voices represented. And certainly one of the pieces <laughs> that I, one of the workshops that's popular besides just how do you and where do you publish is just making space for engaged scholarship among the many things that we do. And also, how do you make visible the impacts when it might not be a journal article or a book? It might be that you're serving on a board that's actually helping to affect policy changes that directly impact community residents. So that's a lot of the work that I do is just helping like make space for community engaged scholarship, bring people together, but also how have others done it? Like, what's it look like? Not in terms of advice, but help me see how you are making this work. Sometimes making a space in your institution or your department or program where none exists so that we can learn from each other. Um, so the How I Write interview series that I run that includes Tania Mitchell from University of Minnesota and Keisha Bentley Edwards, um, who's with Duke, on what it looks like for them. Uh, and then I also uh, organize writing groups around engaged scholarship specifically. So my contact information is there at the bottom um, and the website. There are a range of opportunities that are just writing in general, um, but these are the ones that are particular to community engaged scholarship. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, yeah, and I will just say it is really, um, I think, interesting to see the range of types of support that are being provided. Uh, so this is a very different type of support than, say, um, uh, some of the other organizations, but so valuable. So thank you for presenting it and offering it. Um, Forum for Scholars and Publics is up next. Lou Brown, are you ready to be on? I think you might unmute be myself. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, hi, everybody. I am Lou Brown from the Forum for Scholars and Publics. And um, like Duke Engage, we are undergoing a bit of a change this year. We're now um, a, a little smaller than we used to be and under the umbrella of the Franklin Humanities Institute, but our mission remains the same. And that mission is to be a hub for intellectual exchange and particularly now focusing on the arts and humanities. What that means in terms of the way we operate, the kinds of things that we seek to support is really serving as a hub, uh, a network connecting, a connecting point for people. So faculty, students, staff at Duke who are seeking partners either inside Duke or out in our Durham community or our regional community, a global community, tell us what they're looking for. We help them find people who might work with them in some sort of engagement, whether it's um, developing an exhibit, um, have, putting together a panel, um, having a musical performance, uh, 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 anything that anything that seems to advance their agenda, their goals, and sharing and knowledge exchange, um, creating a knowledge exchange opportunity where everybody learns together. So we're very multidisciplinary. We are multi-stakeholder. We really try to even the playing field, we are not a um, scholarly dissemination site as, as much as we are a, a place for people to learn from each other. So a place where um, can be, <laughs> my cat, um, where um, journalists, activists, artists, and scholars can all sit at the head of the table together and share equally in, um, in and a discussion about the issues that they know about and they care about. Practically, we can provide funding for bringing in speakers, for holding events, for supporting a class project, for turning some element of a course into a public facing component or a publicly engaged component. Um, we can um, 
we, we are really looking in the spring to try to fund some partnerships, explicit partnerships between faculty and artists to work together towards um, some research that they are jointly interested in. And also we work closely with the Duke libraries and archives. And so we really want to think about how Duke can invite publics onto our campus to share in all the variety of resources that we have to offer. So um, our principles are principles of generosity, relationship building based on an ethic of care. And that's really what we how, how we go about our work. So my contact information is on the slide, lou.brown at duke.edu. If you're interested in doing something together, just get in touch. Thanks. And this is Buttercup. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Lou and Buttercup. Uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> um, just a note, uh, if you don't have the chat function open on Zoom, uh, there's a lot of good information, the links to all of these organizations and homepages. Also, uh, you really should feel free to ask questions in the chat of any of our presenters. Uh, if they are general, we will get to them at the Q&A at the end. But if they're specific to the presenters that you're seeing here, they can answer those questions in the chat as well. All right, next up, we have a Social Science Research Institute with Jessica Sperling. Jessica, take it away. Sure, hello everyone. It's great to see you all. Um, so I'm not gonna read our mission because you can all read it, um, but generally speaking, we look to catalyze pioneering social science research and methods and their broader application um, by doing all sorts of things to make the world a better place. Um, I'll note that even though we are the Social Science Research Institute, our sort of mission and focus is twofold, if you will. Um, we focused on engaging and supporting the social sciences, definitely, um, but also linking and building bridges between social sciences and other disciplines. So if you are not a social scientist, don't think that this is not for you, right? That is the, the engagement those outside of social sciences is a critical component to that bridging function, thinking about um, interdisciplinarity as a key component to a lot of what we're trying to do. So uh, what are some resources? Uh, there are a few that I wanna highlight. Um, one is uh, consultations on um, our areas of expertise, which includes community engaged research, also evaluation, um, which, I will say is a partner in many cases with community engaged research in as much as evaluation sort of forces you to consider what is a partner responsive or community responsive question, right? So evaluation um, oftentimes goes hand in hand with community engaged research in terms of really um, first and foremost, the idea of a responsive um, research design. And then we also address other matters regarding research design, data collection, um, focused on many things. We do surveys, focus groups, interviews, administrative data, all sorts of stuff, and analysis on the qualitative and quantitative front. Um, so that, that's true even if you're not working on a community engaged project, but I would love to particularly support those that are, but we support those that aren't as well. Um, and we do this for university-based individuals, so those that are associated with Duke, folks like you who are on this call today. We also, um, through uh, a particular newer partnership, um, which we're so excited about um, with Leslie's office actually, and that she could share more about, are, are offering this very specifically for community-based entities um, as a way to build uh, data, evaluative and research capacity directly in those institutions, not necessarily in the form of a long-term engaged research partnership, which is wonderful, right? But if there are shorter term sort of research, evaluative, empirical analysis needs that would be fruitful. Um, so please do think about both of those as options. In addition, selected workshops and trainings on some of these same topics, community engaged research, evaluation, research design, data collection, uh, again, thinking about recently we've done with Fast Connections, thank you, Laura. Um, focus on focus groups, interviews, surveys, and we have one coming up next Friday on community engaged research. Um, we work in evaluation and applied research partnership with um, Duke affiliated individuals and community based entities. So if folks say, oh, I'm interested in doing this with a community partner, but I don't know how to work with a community partner, right? This is where we could come on to 
advise, but also partner in that really and, and, and sort of be there to help that along. And at times we also lead projects that are in that vein. But I think in, of interest here is our ability to, to partner in that. And that includes on projects that are being implemented, um, but also in things like grant proposals where you say, I want to do this and I don't know how, and I don't know how to speak about it. And I don't know what I need to include or say I'm going to do. Um, and we can partner on those as well. And then um, I'll talk about uh, our MIDS program, Masters in Interdisciplinary Data Science with IID also um, has student capstone projects that are not necessarily community. Sometimes they're more industry oriented, but there are also ones that are with sort of community based partners. Um, so that's an option that's available. And I realized one thing I'm missing here, and this was my error, is um, that one of the Best Connections themes is actually housed in the Social Science Research Institute. So that's education and human development transitioning into next year to race and inequality. Uh, and I'm not gonna belabor that point because Laura already addressed Best Connections very beautifully, um, but I will note that that's another area of focus within SSRI in as much as one of the themes is housed within SSRI. Um, and then we have many affiliates and programs, and I'm not going to talk about all of those now because there's not enough time, but on the slide is a link to them so you can check them all out. They are amazing and do phenomenal work, and we love to support them and want you to think of them as resources. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Jessica. Um, and I will say, uh, th these uh, the order in which these organizations are presenting is alphabetical. It is not in order of importance. I just I should have mentioned that up front. <laughs> and last but not least, just to bring back that <laughs> point home, is Kimmy Gardner with Sir, uh, Duke Service Learning. Thanks, Liz. Hey, everybody. Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's great to see all of you and see both some faculty who teach courses as well as some community partners associated with courses. Um, I'm Kimmy. I'm the Assistant Director of Duke Service Learning, um, and we really exist to connect the academic curriculum at Duke, primarily undergraduate. We do have some graduate courses as well um, that are designated uh, service learning and community engaged with sustained reciprocal and ethical community partnerships. Um, so that really takes the shape of about 30 to 40 courses uh, every semester that have a service learning or community engaged component. Um, typically what that means is that students are engaged in a variety of partnerships, everything from more kind of direct service academic mentorship all the way to in community engaged research and evaluation um, in some of the courses as well. So there's a wide variety of the types of service. And I would say, especially during COVID, um, a lot of that you know, has shifted to be virtual, but has remained strong. And many um, students are now actually engaging in more of that kind of project-based capacity building um, and research alongside uh, local nonprofits. Um, so in terms of some of the resources that we offer um, to faculty and community partners, um, we do have faculty consultants available to work with Duke faculty in designing um, service learning and community engaged courses. So really kind of diving into what are the best practices in course design um, in the curriculum and especially in sustained reflection. That's a really key piece of the service learning pedagogy is that there is reflection on the civic and ethical dimensions of the experience, um, kind of you know who students are as they go out to serve in the community um, and is service even always the most appropriate response so really trying to help students dive more deeply into that um, and build that into the curriculum um, we also offer a faculty community of practice um, so this takes the shape of um, we have the faculty fellows program we also offer reflections for faculty that are teaching service learning and community engaged courses um, as well as national and local speakers that we bring in um, to kind of deepen the um, approach I think to engage scholarship in these courses. Um, we facilitate the labeling of courses with the registrar, so we do that whole administrative piece um, to really make sure students know what they're getting into in courses and know that um, this community engaged piece of it is very important and it is a commitment um, and making sure students are aware of that um, going into these courses. Um, we do also offer course development grants um, and we those range anywhere from $1,000 for new service learning or community engaged courses to $500 on an ongoing basis once a course is established. Um, and we also co-sponsor um, community partner events. So that's something as well that community partners you're welcome to apply for. Um, we typically do up to $250 um, for a Kind of community engaged events. Um, and then we um, do also offer service learning assistance. These are 
students usually with federal or Duke work study who are partnered with courses to help coordinate. We know these courses um, require quite a few more um, logistical load um, than, than other courses. So um, we do offer these service learning assistants who often are interfacing with community partners um, and helping really coordinate the logistics of student service in the community. Um, um, Leonor reminded me that um, one thing I did not include here is that pre-COVID we were offering annually a um, immersive tour of Durham um, called Context and Connections. We really hope to be offering that again soon, um, but that's something else um, to really just immerse um, those who are newer to Duke and even those who may have been here for a while um, sort of in the, um, the history and kind of present day possibilities in Durham. Um, so we can also be a hub for connecting community partners interested in partnering with courses to faculty. So. Um, um, we really um, are try our best to be responsive, welcoming, um, and really just kind of promote best practices in terms of um, student engagement, reflection, um, and sustained community partnerships. So you can um, get in contact with us through our general email. Um, I also can put mine uh, in the chat, but um, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Liz. Thanks so much, Kimmy. Um, I don't know about you all, but I am noting about 10 different things that I'd like to get in touch with people about. So <laughs> I hope this has been as generative for you all as it has been for me. Um, anyways, thank you so much to all of you. I know that's really hard to explain your mission and your uh, mandate and all of your programs in about two seconds. So you did a great job. Thank you. Um, we're now going to open it up. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, if anyone would like, uh, like to ask a question, I think our panelists could ask questions of each other if they wanted to. Um, either you can put it in the chat or if you'd like to use the raise hand function, which if you hover over the bottom of your screen on Zoom um, and you go to the uh, reactions uh, site, you can uh, raise your hand and just uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Hey Liz, can I go? Yes, go for it. Yes. Um, yeah, could you um, give us a little more background? What's the occasion for this um, event? And who who organized it and why? And I mean, it's been great. It's been really informative. Um, but I just, um, I you know, I'd just be curious to know, um, you know, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sorry we didn't provide that up front, uh, but we were hoping to get as much time for you all as possible. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we cut short our introductions. The uh, event is being sponsored by the Collaborative uh, for Community Engaged Scholarship at Duke, uh, which is housed by in Duke Civic Engagement, again, which is housed in Durham and Community Affairs. And really, because our mandate is to make visible um, the resources at Duke the, and for the many corners at Duke that provide resources and support for community engaged scholarship, uh, we were hoping to bring together all of you all, um, and we know that we're probably missing folks, um, to be able to provide a holistic view for uh, both our community partners, a number of whom are on the call today, and also um, for scholars, faculty, staff, and students at Duke who are interested or already engaging in, in community engaged approaches. Um, and that was the idea. Um, I hope that helps explain it, but I think that's really um, what we were hoping to achieve. I'll just mention that it is being recorded, and I know that a lot of our fellows especially were interested in attending and couldn't, so this will be posted later for people who are interested in finding out more as well. Leslie, do you want to add anything there? I think you said it, Liz. Yeah, this is really intended to um, try to help navigating the campus and the resources available for engaged scholarship a little bit easier. Um, and so this is the first time we've done an event like this uh, where it's you know really having a chance to highlight so many different resources, but we hope we'll have future opportunities as well. Yeah, Leonor, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I just want to say that uh, as I listen to all the resources, I see a lot of common things that I wish we can start to identify ways that each of us can collaborate a little bit more. I heard like a lot of us have awards and a lot of us have educational initiative and then the tours. And so maybe we can start to think how we can, as a group, collaborate with each other uh, to make this more accessible to everybody. Yeah, I'll just uh, comment that I think that especially on the community side, it can also be very confusing sometimes to know how to uh, access and navigate all of these different resources at Duke. So 
um, thinking about ways that we can make it more visible um, and holistically visible. All the different, all of these wonderful ways in which they can engage uh, with folks at Duke uh, would be really helpful as well. Anyone else have uh, questions specific? They can be specific for presenters or just more generally. Nope. Okay. Uh, when it, anyways, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you again taking the time on a Friday afternoon <laughs> and an hour of your time and another and yet another Zoom session uh, to be joining us today. Uh, it is so incredibly. Um, I will just say gratifying uh, to see all of the different sources of support and all of the energy and the passion and the interest in this approach uh, from so many different angles from all the different places and centers at Duke uh, where you that you represent today. Um, it is really gratifying and it really is very hopeful, um, I think, at least for me uh, to be able to know that there's so much interest in this approach and also that both on the community side and on the Duke side, that there's so much support for this type of work as well in this approach. Uh, so thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the world, um, but also thank you so much for, again, being willing to uh, share it with each, uh, learning from each other, but also uh, sharing it with all the people who joined us today and who will be watching this recording. So thank you so much and enjoy your weekends. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm.